first thing that I would like to do is to just give thanks to each and every one of you for taking your time out to come here today uh, to listen and to welcome our brother, um, brother Ayokimati, also known as the Irritated Genie. Uh, from the United States. Uh, Brother Kimati is one of, you know, um, the critical and the leading voices in the black liberation movement in the 21st century. And um, he is the founder of an organization known as the War on Horizon, as well as a movement called Straight Black Pride. And um, these uh, institutions represent um, his ideals basically to fight against white supremacy particularly uh, the issue of homosexuality the issue of homosodomy Amanda Mnyama Amanda Mnyama Black power Black power Nguvu nyeusi Nguvu nyeusi Greetings, sons and daughters of Africa. Greetings in the name of our divine African blood, black ancestors, those who came before us. The title Tuba, Kamakushisa Kubakula Basekemu, Kamakushisa Gusuel is a say Africa, Kamakushisa Kubanda Batala, Abasnigaza Inlela, Basnigaza Nobumi. Singabandu, Singabanduana, City, Namsanje, Abatala, Abakulu, Vesizu, Esimyam, Vesizu, Sasa Africa, Izifuele, Ezipilayo, Mazis Pimbilo, Zenzukutum Sebinzi, Esinawa Namsanje, Ubeimbu Melelo. I take this opportunity to welcome our brother our African blood brother, brother Ayo Kimati, the irritated genie. The brother is the warrior in the front line against white supremacy. He is fighting for the liberation of every black woman, man and child on this earth. He is here in this time to share his experience with us here in Azania. So as African blood people here in Africa, we welcome our African blood brother, one who is standing up for our interest, one who don't compromise. Because in this time, we are living in this time of treacherousness, where it is even difficult for us to stand for who we are, to stand for our Africanness, to stand for our blackness. So we give respect each and every time when there is an African soul who is able and willing to claim his soul, who is able to call his soul his own in this time of destruction, desolation, so we give thanks and praises to our ancestors who guided us from the ancient times, the first way ancestors, those who came and established the first way, the ancient ancestors of the African world. We give enough respect to all of our ancestors. And we are saying this gathering must be the gathering that will give us direction that will give us strength and power so that we can continue in this path, in this African liberation path, which seeks to restore our Africanness, to restore our dignity and our integrity. So we welcome our brother, Ayokimati. I know him from, for quite some time. I am one of the, the listeners of War on Horizon. There's a radio program 
is on internet if you are able to tune in there is a radio station is one of the hosts of that radio station i'm one of the fans of war on horizon i've listened to him i've listened to his lectures i know very well what he represent because he represent our interest as black people our interest not anybody's interest our interest as a people as a race different from other people different from other races our interest as, a, as black people because in this time we find black people who stand for the interest of everybody but not for the interest of black people we find ourselves busy doing many things for humanity for human race but not for the black race but this, this is this is the time for us to cultivate the spirit of blackness within us the spirit of africanness the spirit of uprightness because when we are talking about homo sodomy homosexuality we are talking about madness we are talking about confusion we are talking about chaos and we know very well that according to this to the principles of african blood ancestors according to the spirit of our ancestors the spirit of ubuntu the spirit of maat the ancient spirit is the spirit of balance the spirit of righteousness we don't embrace chaos confusion madness illusion fantasy we are about truth reality so i know very well that our brother ayokimati is here to link us with the reality to take us away from fantasy and illusion and to ground us in reality african black reality not anybody's reality so i welcome our brother ayokimati edited the journey to come forward and make his presentation which is strictly about our empowerment as a people as a race we give thanks and praises to our african brothers and sisters give thanks brethren rastafa my ancestors woke me up this morning they say son you do know what time it is don't you i say what time is that they said it's war time so welcome to the war front i like to start by saying rastafari and showing respects for my roster of brothers and sisters that brought us out. Yes, uh, I want to thank my brother Thando for uh, stepping in the gap. When I came, I told him I was coming to South Africa. Actually, I told him when I got here. And I think some of y'all can appreciate it. We've talked about it a little earlier. There are a lot of people who wear the name African. They wear the skin African. They can talk the talk of African. But when it comes to being genuine Africans, fully committed to the liberation of African people, who will stand on the square and don't budge when it's time to take a stand or when it's time to help their brother or help their sister or when it's time to show humility or thanks for a gathering such as this, somehow that African in them disappears and they become something foreign to what we know. So before I jumped in and said I'm coming to speak in South Africa, I had to meet the brother and I talked to him and I went and I met him in the first five minutes. I said, okay, I found the real Africans here. See, wherever I go in the, around the world, I look for the real Africans. Not the ones that say the words, but the ones who actually live in it. The ones who do it every day and every night, who know what it means, who, who have the youth, the Watoto with them. The real Africans who are saying, what is it going to take for us to change the condition we're in? The ones who are not pretending like things are okay. Things are not okay. I'm a person, uh, an African, who was born in America. Washington, D.C., a region we call Southeast. It was pretty rough, probably like Soweto was. In the time when the white, we call them crackers. I think y'all, what do y'all call them here? Settlers. Settlers. When the, you know, remember when settlers couldn't walk in Soweto? They just couldn't just be walking around Soweto. That was, you know, that, that was a free handbag or something you had. I come from a region where they couldn't come where we live. That's how we got our bicycles. We was poor. We didn't have no money. But if we saw a settler riding through with a bicycle, I had me a new bike. You know, that's how we did it. So there was a time when there was a certain element of aggression with African people. We may not have been where we were supposed to be, but we at least could identify 
that there was a conflict with the Europeans, or if we're in Sudan with the Arabs, or if we're in South Pacific with the Asiatics, whoever it was that wasn't an African that was oppressing us, there was a certain level of aggression that we recognized was supposed to be there. And when we had some sense of power in a situation, we exercised that aggression to say, when it's a war, there are two opposing parties. We're not just here to get beat up on, but when we find space to resist and to challenge your authority, we use that space and we maximize it. So that's where I come from. That's who I am. And that's what I was born to do. But as a child, it's one thing to look around and take a bicycle. As I've gotten older, what I realized is my responsibility is one amongst many that has to see what is the vision for the future for African people. Because in the 21st century, the reality that we are facing, there are two options for African people, no matter where we are on the planet. Either we're going to take dominion, meaning total control and power, complete control of every region where we are, where we have numbers and have power. We're going to have to take absolute control and dominion or we're going to be exterminated internationally. So what I'm going to do in this conversation, <clears throat> I'm going to share some of the vision without my visuals, but just follow me with things that you're dealing with here today. And I'm going to show people what we are facing in the 21st century. What are the threats to our survival? And then I'm going to share what it is that as African people, we need to do. We'll start talking about what the major threats to African survival are. And then I'm going to talk about what we have to do to survive the 21st century. So there are four primary platforms of genocide. That means the killing of a race of people that is happening with black people on this planet. There are more than four, but there are four primary things that are being done to kill our people. Each one of them you're facing no different than we're facing in the U.S., no different than Brazil, no different than Europe. It's a universal system of annihilation. Number one, and in no in particular order, but number one, we just start with chemical and biological warfare. That means wherever they find black people, they're poisoning the water. They're transitioning our diets from diets that are plant-based and healthy for African people with our normal natural diet that keeps our, uh, we have many of our elders live to 100 and 115 years old. Now we're dying at 50 years old from heart disease. That's not by accident. It's not uh, 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 just happenstance that all of a sudden we can't live past 60 years old. There's a calculated effort to put the diet, the physical diet of the food that we eat, to give the diet that will kill black people to black people everywhere you go around the world. So one of the number one leaders of death of black people in this country is heart disease. In America, the number one death, uh, killer of black men in America, heart disease. So what we would have to assume if we didn't understand that this was chemical and biological warfare, we would have to assume that for millions of years, our people, because when they traced our ancestry back, uh, the oldest bones they found now are like three million years old. These are African people. So we've been around three million years and didn't have heart, congestive heart failure. And then all of a sudden in the last 50 years, we can't live longer than 50 years old. And that's by accident, it's not by accident. Everywhere that you find black people, the majority of our people are eating a diet that is created by somebody that's not black. So all you have to do to know whose diet black people are on is to look at what oppressor has colonized them in that region. So if I'm in America, I'm eating a white American diet that is killing black people. If I'm in Azania, I'm eating a settler's diet or an English diet that is killing black people. If we're in Sudan, I'm eating an Arab's diet that is killing black people. The question would be, where do we have a region where black people are deciding what the diet is, are growing the food, are carrying the food to black people, are preparing the food, and are feeding our own people? Can someone help me and tell me a place you know like that? So we're in Africa. And I'm asking my brothers and sisters on the continent to name me one place, one country, where we determine what the diet will be, where we grow the food, where we prepare the food, where we transfer it, where we deliver it, and then prepare it for, for eating for our own people. Where we're in control of what we put into our bodies. The fuel for the body is the food. Name me one place where we control that. Yes, sir. To a good degree, my brother. Zimbabweans are trying. 
Okay, so Zimbabwe is a place that they're trying. Sure. That's good. So then the question would be, as we discuss this more, how do we figure out what Zimbabwe is doing right, make it better, and then duplicate it across the African continent, but not just the African continent, the African world. So when we start talking about solutions, that's what I want to do. Every time we say he's giving an answer, then what that means is if they're doing that to a large degree, then we have to figure out how did they do that? When did they make the change to do that? Because we know it didn't start like that under the European settler. So then now we have to start connecting things. What relationship does them putting the whites off the farms and taking their own land have to do with them deciding that they're going to eat their sasa? Instead of eating <laughs> and making part of the meal. I know that, for instance, in Uganda, I've been there. They have the matoke. Very healthy. You don't eat a meal without matoke. I want my gina soup with my matoke. My Ugandan brothers and sisters, I know what I'm talking about here. Uh, they have the bashura, which is a drink that they make. Very healthy out of the millet. They're beginning the process. And I know some of the people who started that to say, wait a minute. Why are we eating an English diet in Uganda? It's a process, but it, it is not a full process that's been duplicated na internationally. But the question would be, is there any reason why black people in Africa should not be growing their own food for their own consumption? Is there any reason whatsoever? Does it make any sense that we would not be doing it? Well, here's the thing. It makes sense. It doesn't make sense, does it? It makes sense. It makes sense. Tell me why it makes sense. Uh, the first historical act of the state is production, it's its own production, that's Karl So obviously the European system has used production as a main means of their way of administrating the state. That example, everything that we produce is out of the raw material, but the production is from Europe or China or any place. Like now, PG, the most well producing gold producing place is China. Now, because they reap from Africa the raw place and material, and have their own production to claim it as their own, what we call it, cultural production. So what our brother's saying now is, and again, we start with the number one thing, but we see these things all tie in. I'm glad you said what you said. So now we have to talk about, we talked about the process we just said. You grow the food, but then you have to prepare it and produce it, and then you have to transport it. So what he's saying is that the Asians, the Euros, the small hats, what you call the white so-called Jews, the Zionists, and various other groups of non-Africans have intentionally with malice of forethought, understanding that if you cannot control production, that you can't produce for yourself, and they've created an economic enslavement, which means even if you grow the food, they create a taste for a finished packaged product, then they pretty much force you for cheap wages, for a cheap amount to send them the raw material. You pay them to package it and then import that which you grew on your own, which means there are a number of things that we have to consider. What makes their packaged products better than the packaging of the products that we do when they're organic and raw and natural? The only thing that makes it better is that we've decided it's better. If control of production is more important, if the whole process is more important to us than a European finished package, then we have to consider teaching that to our children and changing what we want. Changing that which we desire so that we now desire what it is easier for us to produce and then we figure out how to produce it in a way that by the finished product it is a better product. At the end of the day, the bottom line is important to understand at this point. From the medicines we take, I'm driving around when the brothers drive me around Johannesburg and I'm looking at the sign, abortion pills. I'm, I'm looking at the signs on the thing, abortion pills. I'm walking brothers walking around like zombies. Here's what and I was just talking to the elder as he was actually teaching me a lot of things. We were sharing. I was telling him what I've noticed. I've been somewhat around the world and what I'm seeing is a good and a bad. There's a complete genocide that's going on of African people. That's the bad part. The good part is the exact same formula everywhere, which means all we got to do is figure it out once how to fix it. And we got them. In Washington, D.C., in New York City, in all of the major cities in the U.S. right now, they have something they call K2 or K12. It's a drug. It's a, it's, a, it's a synthetic marijuana that young brothers are smoking, and it's driving them crazy. 13 and 15 years old, they go through psychotic breaks, and they can't even function. When I'm driving through the street, and the cab driver is showing me these brothers like this, he's saying they're doing something that's mixed with 
an AIDS drug and something else? I said, it's the same exact. He said they become zombies. I said, that's what we call them, zombies. Right now in the U.S., I'm telling you, as we're speaking, where I live, blocks away, there are young children, 13 and 15 years old, walking around, the young brother, you can't even talk to him. He's a zombie. The exact same formula for destruction, chemical and biological warfare that he's dealing with. Right here in Johannesburg, as I'm riding through the street, I see him going through the exact same thing. Which means if it's the same targeted attack, and we all Africans, then the same solution will, <laughs> the same solution to the problem will work here, it works there. The beginning of the solution is this, we're talking. Now, as I talk here, and you realize that we're facing the same problem in the U.S., we're no longer Azanian and Africans, and we're just Africans. Wherever we are, we're facing the same exact thing. So chemical and biological warfare, major issue with African people because it's easier for them to kill us. And this is a point I want to make because I think it's important. What Europeans and Arabs and every other race on this planet have realized, man to man, woman to woman, there's no one that can fight us. There's no force on this planet that can defend itself against the righteous tyranny of African rebellion. African dominion. When we decide we're going to take over, you have to face me man to man, you're going to lose. That's who we are. So what they simply decided is we'll never face them that way. We will simply make them fight one another. And so we'll get more into that discussion as we go forward. And when we're fighting them, we're not going to fight them man to man because we cannot win. The same way the hyena does. He cannot beat the lion. Lion to hyena. It's not possible. So he doesn't fight him that way. He waits till the male lion is gone. And when the female lions are left, that's when he brings 20 against two. Then he wins. He fights the way that he can win. Chemical and biological warfare, number one. Number two, there's a book called The Destruction of Black Civilization. I brought a copy for my brothers and I have another copy I want to leave with you. I would say it's the most important book for African people internationally because it's 6,500 years of history of where we were in our accomplishments, but also, most importantly, what are the mistakes that we have made? Does anyone here know in that book, he makes it very clear, the key element in the destruction of black civilization is one thing. I mean, there are many different things we made, but there's a key element that has destroyed us. Does anyone know? Integration. Say it again. Integration. Ooh. Integration. It's very simple as this. Every powerful dynastic empire of African people throughout the history of the world that I'm aware of, and I've studied some, every single one of them that was powerful was black ruled. There's not been one powerful integrated black dynasty or empire that has ever survived. The minute we start letting Indians and Asiatics, whites, Arabs, or anybody else in, the minute they come in, the power instantly begins to go out because we are no longer dealing with things the way it works for us. We are no longer looking at the world from the center as Africans moving in our own direction. There's something about us, and it's a, it's a, it's a very big problem. The African tendency is to fall more in love with those who do not look like us than with those who do look like us. We are more prone to pick up a brick or a knife or a gun and shoot a black person, blood of our own blood, flesh of our own flesh, from a perceived different group than we are to shoot a boar. We'll wrap a tire around our own traitors, but then Make a negotiation with <laughs> those that have stolen our land and want to have dialogue. <clears throat> it is a humongous problem. Now, let me show you how they're waging this war of integration against our people today. You've seen it. I know you've seen it because I saw it coming over here. It's the exact same process in America. I, I got it on my phone. I wish I had my screens. I could just show you, but you've seen it already. I turned it to a music channel. This is real, and I don't have to prove it to you because you live here. I'm watching for my brothers and sisters that are watching around the world. I'm in Azania, in Johannesburg. I'm watching television from Johannesburg.
has black males chasing after white females, Asiatic females, or a female who's so light, I'm not sure what she is. I'll call her something or another. I don't know what she is. It's something. Every single video. Now, how do I know this? Because this is the exact same thing that they did to us. They're doing to our people here what they did to us, psychological warfare. The message is implicit. Because if I watch 10 videos in a row, and every one of them have a black male who's been given a lot of money to look like a hero. And every single video, he's running after a white female. Then the white female is the prize and the one that has value. I do not have to say that the black woman doesn't have value. I do not have to say that I hate Winnie Mandela. I don't have to say those words. I show it in my behavior. As I'm desiring the ones that kill Winnie Mandela, the ones that imprison Winnie Mandela, that's who I want. It's implicit. But because we're not stating it, it goes into the psyche. And we actually begin to desire that that doesn't look like our mother, that doesn't look like our grandmother, that doesn't look like our freedom fighters, Miss Sabukwe, who stood for, with her husband all those decades. My brother taught me about the Sabukwe's. I didn't know that before I came. He, he got me up. I like that name now. That's the only name I use now. Wow. Unless I say Winnie first, I don't even say Mandela. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's what you know it is. You know, once you learn the freedom fighter, you think it don't take long to learn. You know who is who. So what are they doing? Psychologically conditioning us. And I want you to hear this because our women don't talk up enough. It's one thing I get upset with our women about. If our women would speak up, some of us that don't even realize what we're doing to them would make a change. Black woman, you've got to start saying, black man, when all you chase and all you show on television is you chasing after a woman that doesn't have her natural hair, who, 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 who's white, or is Asian or whatever she is, the message you are telling me is that you hate me. And what black women need to start doing, don't support, don't go to one concert, don't watch it, don't give any support to any black male entertainer. You gotta have consequences for this stuff. It's called racial responsibility. Because what is happening is that the young black youth, it doesn't matter what you're saying, it does matter what you're saying at home, but hear what I'm saying. They're watching the screen and our, and our ancestors did it like this. They realized over time that people worship what they see on walls. It's a psychological thing. The image impregnates itself in the mind of our people. So our ancestors put Africans all over the walls. And the messages they wanted to leave with us, they put up there. One of the main messages they put up there was, here's Amun is God. Here are the enemies to African people. Here's the king smiting them in their head. He said, you cannot be friends with people that don't look like your people. First, you protect your nation. Then you be nice. You walk with your left foot forward. It's called the Nessie Amsu. You walk with your left foot forward to trample down evil so that your heart can go forward. Before you start this nice guy stuff, first, kill all your enemies first. Who is it that wants to come and rape black women? Well, find them and, and give them a necklace. Who is it that wants to steal your land? Find them and, and, and make them fear you and make them go home to their folks if any of them get away and tell them, don't go down there because it's a problem down there. They don't like us down there. First, you secure your perimeter. And then when you're safe, then we can do what we're doing here. We can fellowship. These are on the walls. And we worship that which is on the walls. So what the Europeans have done in the modern context, they've taken the African psychology. And now the walls are the TV and the big screen. And they show us as black men worshiping white females. What is the result? A steep increase in interracial dating. What does that do? All you have to do, and again, I wish I had my slides so I could show you. All you have to do is look and what you'll start seeing is that you're getting lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. See, when you're living it, you don't see it as much. But if you start paying close attention, you're going to see more and more interracial dating going on. Less and less of black men wanting authentic black women. Why? Because the message is being put out there. I, I lived through it, so I know. Where it got to the point where dark-skinned black women literally had the lowest self-esteem in America to this very day. Why? Because every message they get is that you're ugly to the point where the young boys say, oh, you black and ugly. I mean, literally, those are the words they use. These are black people using it. Matter of fact, when I was growing up, it was called an African booty scratcher. They showed us movies about Africa with some magic white boy named Tarzan swinging through a tree, <laughs> beating up apes and elephants. So we thought Africa was bad, even though we Africans. We don't want to be African. And then if you're dark skinned in Rome, you're, 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 you're African booty scratcher. We watch the cartoons. 
I'm 44 years old going on 45. The young children in America still say that. Same thing. The hatred of Africa, but what does it lead to? When we were growing up, all the brothers want a red bone or a light-skinned woman. Why? Because we've been, and I'm telling you my life experience of what I've seen in my own environment, and I see now through study and research, ah, I see what they do. What are the consequences of this? The consequences is that psychologically, a few things happen. Over the course of one or two generations, literally, you go from being black to brownish till you get to the point where you're no longer even black. And there are civilizations that have done that. In Brazil, they've wiped out in two generations whole groups of black people simply by telling the black to marry on to light, on to light. Now, this is something that's having grave implications and issues because notice who the whites go for. See, I want you to see this because this is, again, 6,500 years of history, but it, we're living it today. Does the white female go for the black man who's struggling in the street who has nothing? Uh, does she go for the guy that looks like he's about to make it or do something? Who's she go for? Ah, the one that has what? Money. <laughs> so, the wealth that comes into our community that we're able to scrounge up under this type of oppression, we get a few dollars, where does it end up going back? It goes right back to the whites. So they take your land first, you fight through that, you find a way to make some money, and now they condition you intellectually and mentally so that the black woman that helped us as men get to where we are in life, we know our women are always there for us. Just like you look at Nelson Mandela in his 27 years, who was it that kept that movement going his name even remembered? It was Wendy Mandela, the black woman. When he gets out, what happens to her? She got to go. This, 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 this is a consequence that opens the door for what they're doing now, which is something else I'll talk about a little bit later, where they begin to turn black women against black men and see black men as their enemy. But it didn't start with black women looking at the world that way. You had to open them up to that. How did they do it? They really made her our enemy by us showing her that we don't desire her. This is an economic, social, genetic genocide that happens everywhere around the world. It's calculated. That's why when I drove down, oh, let me finish. I watched every one of the videos. I saw one video with a sister with natural hair that was the object of the brother's affection. But guess what? Who was she with? Some white dude. <laughs> he was a mulatto, whatever he was. I don't know what he was. And at the end of it, the brother, because the white boy, whatever he was, said, I'm not going to give her up. The brother said, well, here, he put some money on the thing. He said, hey, you take that. I can take her with me. And I'm going, I'm glad the brother fought for his woman, but you in Africa, dude. Why are you fighting? Why are you fighting and paying money for your own woman in Africa? Why do you have to get, what, the messages that are being given, they may seem unintentional. I'm telling you through 40 years of devastation of what I've seen in my community, from a point of where we were some proud, productive people who would fight a lot, to the point now where the same neighborhoods where I grew up, where they couldn't even come around, they come in and take everything, walk around with their dogs, with us with our heads bowed down. It's a psychological warfare that's going on. The reason I spend as much time as I am on this integration one is because this is the same process that explains how we lost Kemet. How did we lose Nubia? We did not lose it in physical battle. We lost it with black males marrying their daughters who were royal onto white boys who then came in and brought more and more white till eventually there were no blacks left or more and more Asiatics till there were no black people left. It's happening around you, every billboard you see. Look at the billboards when you leave here. See if you see a proud, productive black man and proud, productive black woman together on the billboard. No. You're going to see a white boy with a black woman and a white female with a black man. It is a psychological genocide. And it has real active ramifications internationally. I'll go to the next one. Physical land grabbing and violence. That's another big one. If you pay attention, how many of you all know that the Chinese have cities in Africa that black people can't go into? I'm going to say it again. I didn't just say, I'm not just talking about the, 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 how many Chinese are coming into Africa. 
They've built cities in Africa that the African governments have let them come in. Blacks are not allowed. I wouldn't even make this up. In fact, uh, in Kenya, this is, this is a good story. You'll appreciate this one. I had just left Uganda, went back to the U.S., and a story came out on the Internet, you know, on Facebook, where there was a Kenyan restaurant owned by Asian in Kenya that said, no blacks after five. So I put it up on the Internet, and, you know, Uganda's close to Kenya. So one of my guys there in Kenya saw the thing I put up there, and he called, I didn't know at the time, because all I, the next thing I saw was a video with the place that got ransacked and the Asian owner had got arrested and um, they were charging them and everything like that and the, the people just took everything that was in the store and everything. I didn't know what had happened and so I, I, he contacted me and said, yeah, man, I saw the little thing you put up there. I called one of the people I know in government in Kenya and told them. They didn't know. He said he went over there, arrested the guy and told the people, the people just went in there and took everything. So that was a, that was a situation where we, we, we demonstrated some self-esteem, but I just want you to understand, what is the likelihood that one of us could go to China and start a successful business and put on it, no Chinese after 5 p.m. Kill you. What? He said, it'll kill you. What is the likelihood I could go to India and say, no dot heads after 5? If you got a dot, then it's too hot for you to come on. Don't come, go. What is the likelihood I could do that and, and walk out of there a survivor? Could you go to America and say, no, 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 no white folks after 5? But in Africa, our enemies are so comfortable with our weakness and our shallowness and our willingness to be walked over like a mat that they will come into Africa and advertise we're not welcome in our own home. I hear the boys do it all the time. I end up on the boy home. I told the brother, you know, you, you advertise for a place. I've never been here, so, you know, I'm going in quiet. And they had a black dude, a black brother on the advertisement, right? So I said, oh, this is going to be nice. I had a... Big lion on the front of the house. Oh, oh, yeah, boy, that's what I'm talking about. I'm on the real African house. Man, the biggest, wildest boy walked out of the house. I'm like, this. you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I mean, the place beautiful. I said, man, are you serious? I heard them. I mean, okay, do I look black to y'all? Do I look like an African? I'm in the house, and she's actually telling me, you know, the Africans, they, first of all, they, first of all, I'm offended. I'm not saying that because I'm standing. I won't get poisoned, right? I'm like, okay, they. I'm not African now, okay. The Africans, they, they don't know their own history. See, we were here first, and then they came down and invaded other groups, and then they invaded. I said, are you really sitting here trying to... They don't know I'm irritated. <laughs> like, you're actually trying to convince an African. Now, we couldn't even begin to go to China and talk like that. Just talking like that, they'd put you out the country. Talking like that in India. Talking like that anywhere. But we allow this, and we don't have to. We're powerful now. In the U.S., the same thing you're seeing with the land grab. You know, the Portuguese are invading Angola, buying up everything. You can't even get a position. That I've talked to people in, 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 in Portugal, uh, in Angola. You can't even barely get a position in government if you're not a mulatto. So the mulattoes, again, if you read the destruction of black civilization, integration, the key element of destruction of black civilization, the mulattoes, not every single one of them, but as a class and as a group, historically, we're talking about history, just like Barack Obama, he was a pure enemy to African people. I can tell you, I lived there. The only thing he did, he gave the homosexuals everything they wanted. He gave the Zionist small hat Jews everything that they wanted, the white so-called Jews. The Hispanics had everything they wanted. The only thing he did to black people was say, you must be gay. And then came to Africa and said, you must be a homosexual. That's the only thing he did in reference to black people. A pure enemy, but he came out of the wound of the European. And they've used this mulatto trick for thousands of years because what they realize, again, they know that they cannot physically deal with us. But they found something that's worked as far back as Lucius Septimius Severus in Rome, when they really wanted to come into Africa, in North Africa, and invade and finish off the last surviving spiritual systems we had. The Romans said, we gotta go in here and do this, but if we go in and tell them we're doing it, we don't have a fight on our hands. So they said, how do we do it? They elected their first black, he was a mulatto, general, uh, uh, leader of Rome, Lucius Septimius Severus, who became the most violent and brutal Roman emperor to his time in terms of the slaughter of African people. Why? Because we saw him as being black, and what did we do? We laid our arms down. We happy, we got a Roman who's in charge, a black Roman. Oh, he's going to look out for us. Came in and slaughtered and destroyed the last uh, spiritual empires 
in North Africa. Everybody okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, we're good. You're good? All right. This is what they do, Europeans. Nelly Fuller talks about it in a different context. Um, but historically, this is the move. Whenever we congregate in large numbers in a place, our natural, no matter how much oppression they put on it, the natural inclination for our spirit to start to connect and for us to start to build relationships, friendships, family ships, and now we rely on one another. We trust one another. I know your sister. I know your mother. I know your grandfather. We know one another. We start building. We start figuring out how to do things. We start developing into small empires. It, it, it takes a while, but we start developing. Their strategy is before they can get it right to actually start taking the power they have as these groups and leveraging that power into more power and become empirical, imperial, imperial, meaning we got this neighborhood, we want the next neighborhood. While we still in the idea of we just building up something and doing better, before we start thinking, why is it just good enough to do better here? We're going to keep this and we're going to take that too. And next you know we're going to take that too. Y'all remember some groups y'all had? <laughs> you know, y'all had groups here like that, that we as African people, we're imperial too. Prior to 323 BC, when Alexander the Greek came into Kemet, Egypt, land of the black people, in the whole of the history of Europe, the idea that a man could be in love with a woman never existed. I'm going to say it again. Europeans, whites, in the whole of Europe, they would have sex to have children. But the idea of a bonding relationship of warmth, that feeling, brother, you know, when you saw that sister, you was like, man, what is this? I can't get rid of this thing, man. I just, I got to get it. I have to have her. You know, sister, you know, when you saw that brother, you're like, what is it? I don't do this. I won't do it. He, whatever he's, I just got to go. It's just that thing that we find so beautiful. In all of the history of Europe, in fact, before they came into Africa, I want you to start looking at the ancient, what they call classical Look at the classical artwork. It's all males with males. You won't find classical artwork with men with women. It was not part of their culture. I want you to hear this. Do you know what they call their highest and noblest aspiration? We don't even have a word for it in Africa. It was called pederasty. What is pederasty? It is when a grown male kidnaps and rapes a little boy and makes him his lover. I'm going to say it again. Let me, let, me, let me be more specific. The god of the Europeans at that time was called Zeus. Who's heard the name Zeus? All right, good. So you can look this up for yourself to see I'm not making it. So you go get on your, your Google. You put it right there. It'll come up. What was the, the whole story of Zeus? He had all these wives, husbands, everything, animals. Yeah, he was he had sex with animals. That's who he was. But there was one love of his life. Now, this is what they called love. I want you to understand. They used to sit around the fire roasting marshmallows telling this to their children. This is the love story of Europe. Zeus had all of these partners, but he looked down on earth and there was a young male, adolescent, teenager, named Ganymede, a little boy, white male. He falls so in love with him that this is what they call falling in love. He turns himself into an eagle. He descends on earth, kidnaps Ganymede, takes him to Mount Olympus, repeatedly sodomizes him, and makes him his lover. Y'all with me? In fact, who's heard of uh, Plato, the great Greek philosopher? He called pederasty, which we would call homosexuality or pedophilia. We call it homophilia because it's both. It's pedophil they didn't actually have this thing called homophilia, homosexuality when they were two adults. See, that's the lie that they tell us today. It's a lie. Their construct was a grown male raping a little boy. There was no female involved at all. The females, because they were left out, started messing with each other. But the, the, the real construct was... The grown male with the little feet, with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the little male. It was called pederasty. This is what Plato says in his symposium. Now, this is what the Europeans say. This is the birth of philosophy, which, again, philosophy comes from Africa. But we're going to leave this one with them. We're going we to let them say, this is the birth of your European philosophy. He said, pederasty alone, meaning a grown male raping a little boy. He said, that alone is capable of satisfying a man's highest and noblest aspirations. And the love between man and woman when spoken of at all, is altogether inferior. It is a purely physical impulse whose sole object is the procreation of life. 
In other words, the only reason a male wants a female is because you got to produce children. But, ah, oh, when you want to be in love, you got to go rape a little boy. Now, hold that and don't let me forget to come back to that because uh, now I, wanna, I don't want to step on any toes. So I'm not trying to take anything from anybody, but I have to deal with spirituality. I'm going to deal with that after I go into the African, though, because when I come back, you're going to see what happens with integration. How, how this stuff gets meshed and merged, and then we end up all confused. So is everybody clear? Matter of fact, you've heard the thing, let's go to the gym, right? Do you know where the gym came from? It was called the gymnasium in Greece. The gymnasium was with the place where the white males would be, and they would have all these young males there. And they would be naked, running around. And then a white male who had a wife and children was expected once he got enough money. You could only do this if you were, you had to be somebody to do this. Now you've made it in Greek society. Now you go to the gymnasium. You leave your home for as much as three months at a time. And they had a whole way they did it. You're supposed to find the young male that you like. Then they had a game with it. So you find the boys that are his friends. And you pull them to the side, give them a little money and say, look, trick your friend to come out here. Then once they trick their friend to come out there, you snatch him. And you take him and pay for the right to do it. And you go make him your lover. In the gymnasium. That was what the gymnasium was. For the place for the grown males to go hunt little young boys. Now we go to the gymnasium with the little skimpy jeans, the little skimpy pants and stuff. So they can see all your prowess and stuff. And they sit around watching. We have no idea what we're part of. But <laughs> that's why, you know, when they play their games now, they brother, pop, hit him in the butt. You did good. Smack him in the behind. This all goes back to the Greco-Roman, homophilic, sick, perverse, sexual culture. But understand, it's deeper than sexual. Because it's one thing when you're a freak, but when you put that on your God, that means you believe in this. Their God, his highest and noblest aspiration was to be with a little boy. Now I'm going to bring it back home. It's going to hit hard when I come back around. Let me go to Africa. Can we leave the decadence of Europe for a minute and just go to Africa? Go home? All right. The oldest story known on the planet, the oldest story. This is a story that was an African story. The story of Asar, Asad, and Haru. Anybody familiar with that story? Anybody not familiar with that story? Let me see. Okay, let me tell you our African story. And it wasn't religion as much as it was a story with ideas. There was a god and a goddess. They were born simultaneously. Neither one better than the other. Not from the rib. <laughs> not from, taken from no rib with no barbecue sauce or nothing, no. <laughs> they were born and created simultaneously. So Asar and Aset. Asar was the man. He was the great king. Aset was his wife. Asar was the ruler of the kingdom. It was a benevolent kingdom. It was thriving. He was loved by all. He was good, man. You know, the, the great leader, wonderful person, justice, fair, uh, strong. He was everything you wanted. He was ideally perfect, you would say. And his wife loved him, but they had never had a child. But he had a jealous brother. There was a twin brother named Set. And his brother was so jealous of him, he felt like I should be in the position of a saw. Why isn't everybody worshiping me? Why is he the king and I'm not the king? So he called 24 conspirators together and invited his brother to a party. And his brother had no idea. It's my brother. You know, yeah, I'll come to the party. Got him drunk up. You know, they drinking wine and he's feeling good. And he says, lay in the sarcophagus, which we call a coffin today. So Saul lays in the, in the sarcophagus and then 24 men come and kill him and cut his body into 14 pieces. And then take those 14 pieces and spread them throughout the Nile Valley. So now he's killed his brother Asa. And now the kingdom goes into an uproar. Because of course people are upset. So now you got war. Which of course leads to famine. And death and bloodshed. And so now you got this horrible situation. But our ancestors said. And see this is something for us to understand as black men. This is our story. Our ancestors gave us this. So this is, this, this is not no make believe. It seemed that all hope was lost because they had never produced a child. So there was no one to come to the throne. But what happened is his wife loved him so much that she said, even in his physical death, I owe him at least a proper burial. So she went throughout the Nile Valley. We talking about going through papyrus swamps with alligators and hippos and to find every piece of his body. She found 13 pieces all except his phallus. And so she put him back together and wrapped him in white linen cloth and gave him a proper burial. And his spirit was so appreciative of the love that she had for him 
that his spirit came back and impregnated her with a child because of that love and connection that she had to him. And she got pregnant with a baby. Now, what was our ancestors really saying? Because, of course, with no phallus and you're dead, you can't produce a child. What they were saying is that the black man represents power, but the black woman is magic. I as I said, if you pick a right black woman, even if you're physically gone, she will take the best that you are, eliminate the worst that you are, and make children that are two or three times better than you, even in your physical absence. She has the power to not only be what she is, but she can take the best that you are and absorb it, and she can translate it into something that becomes even better. She's the real hero in the race. She's the Winnie Mandela. You off in jail somewhere, but she's out here fighting harder than you ever fought. She's out here dealing with harder stuff than you dealing with in there, and she keeps it going because that's who the black woman is. And she produced a child, and she had an option. She could have been scared for him, or she could have been a real black warrior. And she wasn't a physical fighter, but her husband was. And so she told the son when he was young, your uncle, that evil one that everybody's afraid of named Seth, who killed, he's the one that killed your father because he was jealous of him. And your job one day is to grow older create an army and take the throne from him. So now she put a lot of the five-year-old boy hearing that, just the meanest guy in town, everybody's afraid of him. He's actually trying to hunt down Haru to kill him because he found out, I know what this young boy's gonna do, this is the son of Asar. Long story short, he grows up, he develops an army, he goes into battle, and in the battle, he's fighting, he's doing well, but then he loses an eye, a physical eye. And he begins to get depressed and wonder, have I led these men you know, astray? And then his father, Saul, comes to him in spirit and says, son, have I, you really believe that I have you? He asked his father, have you forsaken me? And he says, son, he said, I'm with you in spirit. You're all that I am and more. He said, but you can never doubt your capacity. Think about what your mother did. I was physically dead and she brought you to life even through that. If a woman can do that, what are you to be questioning whether or not you can win this battle? And so he realized that I lost one eye. His father said, yeah, but you're looking with the wrong eye. Look with your other eye. That's right. And that's where when you see in Kimmy, you see the eye, the all-seeing eye of Haru. Because what happened is now, he had a physical eye missing. But on the battlefield, he began to see things differently. He said, oh, we need to go this direction. and this. Way. No, we need to stop here and pull back. No, let's go in here. He began to see it like X's and O's. He saw everything. Because his spiritual mind saw what was necessary to win the battle. He wins the battle with that eye. And defeats his evil uncle Set and becomes the king, the ruler of the land. The Christ, the caress, the savior, the hero, Haru. That's where we get the word hero, from Haru. The resurrected savior, the son of Asa, the son. The son is the savior. Y'all hear me? Now, so now we see, and I want to compare this in contrast, because now you'll see what happens with integration. The African story of spirituality has a god, a goddess, and an immaculately conceived child who was perceived through a spiritual birth. Yes, sir. You are standing just right up next to the same concept here. <laughs> sure, my brother. Thank you. It's duplicated throughout Africa with different names. It's the same story. It is an African story. Can you tell me the name of these here? Does anyone know? This, for example, is the goddess Nomkubuluan. Nomkubuluwa. Yes, this okay. is the wife of Onkulunkulu. Onkuluku. Onkulunkulu, who is God, God. basically. Asa. God. Asa. Yes, okay. Mang, yes. And this is uh, the God. Sure. Uh, okay. Let me say this. And who is that eagle right there? Yes, sir. Yes, the brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Everything simple. Yes, That's called the mother, the father, the son, sure. and yes. the Holy Spirit inside of you. Mm. And what is the son's name? Uh, we call it Mutamai, Omohan Bunvelinyan, Katamachor. Okay, so I'm not going to try to repeat that, but take that and listen to this. Haru was depicted as what? As the falcon. Eh? As the falcon. Right behind you. <laughs> the falcon, the falcon. As you see here, this is the ancient African story. Why was Haru the falcon? Because at night, when it gets dark, everything is dark, we symbolize that darkness as a lack of hope, like it's over. But in the morning when the sun comes up, that's hope coming back again. And who do we see flying up 
As soon as the sun comes up in the sky, the falcon flying right in the sky representing hope, never give up. No matter how dismal things look, never think that it's over because if you're an African, there's always a new day. That spirit that's in us will rise. It's our responsibility to rise with it, though. It doesn't happen by itself. You have to know it. You have to be it. You have to live it. You have to live without consideration or concern for failure. You have to know that it's your purpose, and you have to move forward. And you have to do it. It doesn't do it itself. But that spirit that he said that's in us is what our ancestors said. It's not a Christ out there. It's the potential in each one of us to rise to the occasion. Thank you. That was important because it's right. I'm telling the story that I didn't need to tell because it's right here. But this is where we have to understand what happens with integration. We talk in spirituality. I'm not disrespecting anybody or hurting or trying to, you know, offend. But I want to tell you what happened. The Europeans did not have spirituality or religion until they came to Africa. When they took it, we told you what they did with Zeus and Ganymede. As they moved on into the Christianity and developed it, this is what they did. Originally, the first one was called the Roman Catholic Church, as they take Christianity. It was God the Father, Mary, Mother of God, and Jesus, the Son of God, the Holy Spirit. This was the problem. The African Trinity had a sar. I said they were equal. They were balanced. Not, they weren't the same as a man and woman. They had their own roles, but they were balanced. And an immaculately conceived savior, which matched the culture of Africa. Black man, black woman, black child, black family, black life. The Europeans are misogynistic. They hate females. They think that a grown male should be with a little boy. Well, there's a problem with God, Mary, mother of God, and immaculate seed child, because then she would be on the same level with God as a partner. They came to Kemet, they blew up every female statue they saw, because they said, why are they worshiping women? Women have no value. So they had a conflict stealing our religion and changing the names, but with a woman in that position. So they said, wait a minute, how do we make our spirituality match our homosexual, homophilic, pedophilic culture? So they said, we'll keep God the Father, we'll keep Jesus, Son of God, but who will we replace Mary with? And they said, well, we don't have no Mary nobody to replace with. Well, let's make up somebody, Holy Ghost. So some magic ghost comes in the way. Now we got three men to produce life. Now we got a nice homosexual, all-male trinity, which is why, now I'm going to really hit home. Y'all ready? Because I know that hit a little bit, but I'm going to hit, you want to the center place, solar plexus. Hold on. Make sure you got somebody behind you so you don't fall off your thing. <laughs> so in the Catholic Church, who is the most spiritual member of the church? <laughs> the Pope, the priest, right? What is it that the priest cannot do? They can't be with a woman, but who are they known to be with? <laughs> Their spirituality, all spirituality is, is a people's expression of what they are and who they are and what they do. And connecting it to the creator that, that, that drives them to do what they do. It is our interpretation of how we see the creator. They made theirs what they are. We have to get back to making ours what we are. Which is why the danger in the modern context, whether it's Islam, Christianity, or Judaism, all of them have been taken from us. But then each of these groups have culturalized it to their cultural norms. And then we live in another folks' cultural norms, and then we start living like other folks. That stuff doesn't work for us. So, let me go into this whole homophilia. This is their cultural paradigm from time immemorial. They did not even know of the concept of a man loving a woman until they came into Egypt. And they saw the black man. They, they had temples to the goddess of Set. I've been there. Uh, in Dendera. Uh, 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 to Heteru. Where the men are worshiping, you, you having a child, well, you're not going to go to the father god. You, you want your, your wife to have a, a healthy pregnancy. You go to the mother goddess and say, please, let, her, let, let my child come out healthy. The European had no understanding how a man could respect a woman in that way. So they just defiled all of that. So they are changing the world into a reflection of their cultural, spiritual personality, if you want to call that spiritual. It's who and what they are. That's what I mean when I say spiritual. In order to do that, here's their big issue. They did not really understand it in the modern context. 
as well. They look at the world, they're very arrogant. They believe everything and everybody is like them. They did not understand how egregious a response they would get from African people trying to push us into that paradigm, homosexuality. It's so far away from, we don't even have words for it and raping children and this madness. It's so far away from where we are, they didn't understand what they were doing. Now, they had a benefit in slavery and apartheid. They could just rape and nobody could do anything about it. They didn't really get to see what we thought about it. They didn't get, it was no discussion. They just take your son and rape him. What you gonna do? That's what Cecil Rhodes did. Cecil Rhodes, another homophile, a homosexual, his boyfriend, Neville Pickering, I got it in my book. I mean, this all, this idea is you now have a voice. We now have a voice everywhere we are. So now what happens is they're saying homosexuality is normal. You must accept it. It's like, nah, we're we not, we not enslaved no more. Nah, we're not doing that. A man's supposed to be with a woman. So now a new type of war is occurring. The problem, during the time that we've been oppressed and colonized, who was educating us? So now that we're getting our voice back, we come off a hundred years of education from who? Our enemies. <laughs> our enemies. So when you turn on the television, which is their expression of the ideas that they want, they're going to give you an effeminized black male who's walking around. Ah! You want to slap him, you know what I'm saying? Shut up, you know what I'm saying? You, you just want to slap the dude, you know what I'm saying? They're going to make that normalized. Why? Because it's a new imperialism. It's the same imperialism, but now they want to condition your mind. They now want to colonize your mind. The very core of who we are as African people, black man, Black woman, black child, that was easy for us. You know, figuring out how to get our land back and our economics, that stuff is a little more complex, you know, how to deal with these integrationist groups and this group and that group and all our, those things are difficult. But man, woman, child, that is not very difficult. You know, man, we like the woman, it is pretty simple. However, through cognitive conditioning and miseducation on every means, legal, legally, you don't have the legal right to oppose it now. And that's everywhere. In, in, in America, it's so bad now. They, they have curriculums in the schools. Your, school, your children are mandated to go to school. They're going into kindergarten teaching your son he can be a girl and your daughter she can be a boy. So a lot of us are pulling our children out of the schools. I don't let my children. I got a, a six-year-old daughter and a five-year-old son. I don't let them go to no school. Because you teach my child that, you're going to have a problem. I mean, a physical problem. Then I'm going to end up in somebody's prison. And I'd rather be here than in the prison. So we don't send them to the, uh, the schools. But the same thing they're doing there, they've done here. I look at it. I mean, it's very evident. You turn on television, you got videos with females kissing each other. That's not African. It's not a debate about nobody's rights. The rights are for Africans. We're not sitting here debating the rights of our enslavers and their culture. They, 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 their culture has no rights in Africa. What are we talking about? Are we not Africans? I mean, I mean, have we gone so far from our center that we want to now tell Shaka Zulu he did the wrong thing to have a wife? We want to tell uh, Baba Subukwe, you shouldn't have had a wife. You should have had a husband. We fallen that far away into insanity? No, is that we have not properly recognized the new war. This war is more dangerous because, I'm going back to what I was saying earlier, in each of these other cases of warfare, they have to be here to manage it. This is what happens, and this is the process. When a black child is sexually molested, by an adult or a teenager. You break the natural sexual development of the child. It creates a confusion and a pain and a discomfort that then either of two things happen. They get assistance and help to struggle through that and that struggle can last their entire life, but they can manage it or they're gonna go into dysfunction. Now, what are the dysfunctions? If there was no European to pull them into homosexuality or pedophilia, then the natural dysfunction would be the girl would feel like she has no value and then she starts sleeping with all the guys that want her because she doesn't feel valuable because she's been abused and it's been taken from her. Or alcoholism, drug use because of the depression of not knowing how to fill that hole in the soul that's been taken away. 
These are the natural products of sexual abuse. Also, for the female, hatred for the male who did it. And that can extend to the group of males. So if a black woman doing slavery was raped by white males, her hatred towards whites intensifies beyond just the enslavement because of what he's doing to her. But now, if we begin to adopt the European personality and we're the ones that rape, she not only hates that man, but that black male principle. Because we, as those who are conscious, come to her and tell her the Euro, the Arab, the Asiatic is the devil. But she's seen the devil face to face and there was nothing white or Arab about him. And so now that begins to extend beyond just the everyday brother or the one that did it to her. Now all the males look the same to her. And with the European conditioning of black males hopping on television, pouring liquor bottles on black women, defiling them like they have no value, it makes it believable and true to some extent that black males don't value black women. So what then happens? Now the ground has been properly set for the European to pull our people into the madness. How does he pull the woman in? She already resents males because she's been brutalized by males. That idea of intimacy with a male is too painful, but she's still a woman and she wants intimacy and caring. And so they introduce her to a female being the one that can give her that, who many times is one who's been through the same thing anyway. And so now they draw our women into a European psychopathology that was all created by them from the beginning but that they then made cyclical because now we're doing it without no European around. And because we don't talk about it in the families, that one uncle can molest all the children. And they're all of them messed up. And they all of them don't know where to go. And nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to get a tire and a match for this guy. Nobody wants to stop the cycle. So now what happens is it spirals out of control. And now the European, now with this spiral out of control, the women now resent the men. They want to fight with the men, not help the men. They want to fight and resist. Now is the perfect opportunity now for them to go after the males. So they molest the males and they rape the males. And they go in the, in, the, in the Jesuit schools. Any of y'all that been in the schools, you know what I'm talking about. The Catholic schools, that's what they do. It's their culture. That's who they are. There is no such thing as Jesuits who don't molest children. Why are you a Jesuit then? How you a Catholic priest and you don't molest children? What does that mean? That makes no sense. You got to reach your highest and noblest aspirations. What if they're in a black school and there are no white children? Who are the children getting molested? I've been to uh, uh, Uganda and talked to the people who are the girls talk about how the, 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 the nuns pulled them into that madness and stuff like that. I've been where they talk about the brothers in Congo where the U.S. back forces and the other Western back forces went in there giving these black males guns and weapons and training the brothers. And what did those brothers do? sick. These brothers go into a village and they would take a brother and the brother said for one year, I, I, I mean it hurts. The brother said for one year they would line up 11 boys young boys to the old you know, that they had with weapons and each one of them would sodomize him every day for a year and the way it came out you know, once that part of the war was over in Congo he's back there with his wife, he doesn't want to be intimate with her, she doesn't know why he goes to a psychologist and he tells the story. So European imperialism, see, this is what we don't understand. We just look at the outgrowth and say, oh, no, we shouldn't be upset with homophilia or homosexuals or whatever. We don't understand the groundwork that has to be done to create this. Some black person has to lose their right to their self-esteem and to their sexuality and to their sanity for this process to even begin. Someone must be raped. And invariably, it's a male and a female. They must be violated in order for even a homosexual to exist in the African context. If you remove pedophilia, rape, and abuse, there's no such thing as a homosexual or a pedophile in the African context. We have structured environments. You want that woman? You got to go talk to her father first. He got to look you up and down. Is this man going to be able to take care of my daughter? Somebody here know what I'm talking about? Am I making this up? I'm in the right place, right? This is Africa when we're African. When we're Africans who've been violated by Europeans, they change the full context of our very existence. And we end up in a cycle of behavior that we don't know what's going on until we finally work through the process and understand what's going on. Once we understand it, now we realize this is a very sophisticated war because now you've molested this boy who's damaged, who now doesn't feel like he can be a man because of what he's been through. 
and now has felt some kind of sentiment with another male and has either got to fight that pain and stand as a man and walk without any type of understanding, just, I'm not going to do this, or fall into it, going after males. Maybe I'll rape a young boy now because they did that to me. I'm going to do it, become cyclical. Now he goes in where are the people like me that have been damaged and let me go in and involve myself in this pain. Now I need drugs because what I'm doing is so evil and anti-African and anti-self and so self-hating that I got to be able to have something to soothe the pain off that. So give me something to shoot in my veins. Give me something to know the pain of the grievous action I'm taking against myself because of the pain that has been done to me. This is why this is the most dangerous assault. Because while this cycle is going on, the European can go, he can go to the moon if he wants for the next three years. If we don't stop this, he doesn't have to manage white supremacy. You're not going to get cooperation, black man with his brother and his sister. And his, you're not going to get that cooperation. Why? Because he was molested by a male and his mother didn't look out for him. So now he hates women because his mother was off because she had been messed up. He re re disrespects women. Now he beats women. He has no respect for them. Now he's brutalizing them. Not understanding that brutalization making her hate men. And now the, the lesbians are out there telling her to come this way now. So now we are now creating a refueled, remanufactured, eurosexual, psychopathic uh, uh, cycle within our own community that doesn't require his presence. It's a quiet reality. I want people to understand. I'm, I'm telling this truth because everywhere I go, I, once I finally realized it was a painful thing, but I don't have to know the story of any area with African people. This is the story everywhere I've been on the planet. There's a serious crisis, not once or twice in a society. It's happening every day, every night in our communities. Nobody wants to say nothing or do nothing about it. In every black community I've been through around the world, it's quiet because we're so embarrassed and ashamed we don't know what to do. The wife is with the husband. She didn't, she didn't know about this. She didn't know a man would do this, but she doesn't know what to say or do. So she said, keep it quiet, and he continues to do it. Or the women are involved in this stuff, and a man got a woman he thinks is his, and he comes and finds out she's into this stuff. He has no idea what to do. So he makes it even worse by beating her physically. She's not physically sick. She's psychologically sick. What she's doing is horrendous, but she didn't make that for herself. It's not a defense for it. I'm saying we have a crisis now that we have to put open. Not open to shame ourselves. We didn't make this problem for ourselves. We're not landless because we made ourselves landless. Somebody came and took our land. We don't be ashamed if somebody took our land. We just got to take it back. You know what I'm saying? We just, we just have to organize and get it back. Well, we got to get our sanity back, too. This is the number one crisis. This is why you have laws in this country. See, I want you to see how they do it. They're very sophisticated. As they loosen the noose around your neck, they tighten the noose around your mind. Now, you as an African actually got to be careful about saying a black man is supposed to be with a black woman. I want you to just think about that. For a million years we've been on this planet, it's been normal. You never even had to say that like that. It's ridiculous. It's just, it's nature. You get about 13, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's just, nobody has to tell you this. But now, as an African, you got to put an eggshell down and walk over and make sure you don't crack it. To say that a man shouldn't be beating on a black woman, we're crazy now. To say that a woman shouldn't be talking about, I got a woman's movement. What do you mean you got a woman's movement? If my mother has breast cancer and is killing a lot of black women, don't I care? You got a movement to stop breast cancer, and because you're a woman, you're leading it, fine, we'll follow you, but we got to help you. I don't want mama to die. I don't want my wife to get this. Ain't no movement you got as no woman that don't have a black man. You're just as much as fool as the white folk. That's like black men having a movement. We got the black men's movement. To do what? I ain't gonna hang out with y'all all night, you know what I'm saying? We hang out most of the day. I got a wife to go home to, man. I got some children. Everything that we do as African people from time immemorial has been designed to make a better life for our families. That's just who we are. What they are creating is psychopathology and tyranny 
in a sexual manner that is being used to go in a direction. And I'm going to do this part, and then I'm going to talk about what we're going to do. Y'all all right? Yes. I'm going to lay this last little piece down because I think it's important. In this particular aspect of the war, what they realize is coming in physically, taking the land, they got to stay here to keep that. We can fight them back. They can lose that battle. Poisoning us, chemical and biological warfare, we can start making our own food, making our own medicines, go back to our herbal way. We can, we can change that. Uh, in a racial day, we can just stop doing it. Dude can say, I'm, I'm done with you. Becky, go. I got to go get me a black woman. I was crazy. I'm not crazy no more. We can just change those things. But this one, see this one, you've killed the African without physically touching them because you have shells walking around, euros in black skin. Euros in black skin can build no empires, can overthrow no one, can push no one off land, can build no economic infrastructure, can educate no one. You can do nothing but be sick and easy victims. When have you known any homophiles to build anything? A standing structure that produces for black people. Name one of your warriors or warrioresses that fought for your freedom that was a homophile. And they don't have to be in, in Azania. Name them anywhere. None. Why? Because you're already dead. We are already dead in that condition. It doesn't mean that we can't come with new life. We're Africans. Our story is that we can resurrect. But you can't resurrect in that condition. There's no resurrection. It's death. They would prefer to have physical shell Africans living as homophiles because then they can play with them. Then they would to just kill all of us. They would rather we accept this because then, first of all, we can't fight for ourselves. They can do whatever they want to us. But then they can play with us. They can play with our sons and turn them into their daughters. They can play with our daughters and turn them into their sons. They can do whatever they want to do. You have an actress here. Shaliza Thoron, have y'all seen what she's doing in the U.S.? Took a little black boy, all boy. They got the pictures of him fighting against her, drag, she's dragging him on the, on, on the ground as a little child. Now he's like two or three years later now, he's wearing full dresses. She's turning him into our sons and to their daughters. That is the new construct. Emasculate you, black man. Take away your manhood, black woman. Take away your softness and your warmth and... And, and that, that, that special magic that you got and turn you into some kind of queer freak and weirdo or un-African or non-African. It's the most dangerous threat we've ever faced because it's not a physical person that we have to go fight. It means we have to do introspection. And the first thing we have to do is say no. We're not negotiating with a Boer or an Englishman or a Frenchman or any of them or Arab or none of you. You're all enemies anyway. We're not negotiating with you. We're not going to be homophiles. We have to stop trying to make super fancy arguments, and we have to do what we just did here. See, I, I can outline it for people, so it's not a dispute, dispute anymore. The next step, once we get the understanding, so that our people realize, because our people have been hurt, and a lot of our people are grabbing onto it because they don't know anything else. Once they get the real message of what happened, what I'm saying to them will resonate because they've been through it. And they know somebody loves them, but they can't be in this condition. It's unacceptable. Then they can begin the process of transitioning. But they can't transition if black people will not stand up and say no to this. We got to stop talking about apologizing. Uh, do, do we, do, do, do you think homosexuals have rights? No, they don't have no rights. I want you to think about something. A person is born in Azania. You got rights when you're born in this country, right? So what new rights do you get when you decide to go involve yourself in a homophile relationship? Right. So whatever rights you had, you had before you participated in this madness. If anything, you're going to lose some rights. No, you don't have rights being a sexual degenerate. You have a right being an African. And whatever rights you had being an African before you went crazy and went awry, then the same rights you have, and if you don't stop acting crazy, you might lose them rights. There's no rights for insanity. When is it? When, when is it? Do you have the rights to steal somebody's land? They can make a word for it. And now the boys that steal the land, stole the land, now they have rights. I have rights as a settler. No, you don't have rights. You stole land. You're a thief. No. How are you gonna how are you gonna manufacture a concept? Contrary to me in my house, you walk in my house, say that the, the room is empty. You wasn't using the room, it's my room. Now it's my house. Make me work in the house, rape my wife, rape the children. And now I'm supposed to use your logic in my house? 
When does the African say, hey, food is my house? I make the rules. And homophilia is illegal. It's illegal. It's the most illegal. Raping a child, it's illegal. And we don't go into no long court process. If we find that you're violating the children and we actually certain that you did it, you don't get no long, long trial and no long uh, lawyers and attorney. Why do you need an attorney? You raped a child. You done done irreparable damage. You messed up. You didn't want to live. Shouldn't we be that way? I know we should be that way because it's who we are. It's a natural instinct for an African black man to want to protect black women and children. It's not an instinct for him to naturally want to hurt children and hurt black women. But the European has come in and changed it. Change the whole context of our personality. And it's time for us to get it back. So now I want to wrap it up. Then I want to ask, let it open up a question and answer. But I want to talk about the vision. How y'all feeling? Was it worth coming here today? We're going to talk about something different now. I want to talk about what we're going to do. Because a lot of times, you know, we can talk about the problem. But we also got to talk about solutions. Let me move out from here because I'm, oh, you know, they got the cameras there. Okay. I want to get close to the folks. But, um. What are we going to do? So what I'm sharing now, it's a hundred year plan of vision. So I'm not giving all the details of how we get there. That'll be everybody here's job to figure out where you belong in this and what your job is. But I just want you to see a vision to understand where we're going because we have two choices, empirical conquest or extermination. I prefer the first. So we're going to go with empirical conquest. And then you can listen to all the Negroes and the, the fake blacks that'll give you other ideas of how you're going to multiculturalize and love. This is the most ridiculous thing in the world. Have you ever heard a lion talking about how all of us beasts in the wilderness are going to get along? Are we going to get a, the wildebeest are good friends of No. You're not going to survive that way. You teach your, you teach your little lion cub that. No, you got to kill him. You got to eat him. He got hyenas over there. Those are, there's no such world where all races get along. It never exists. The only people walking around with that ridiculous idea are African people. Indians ain't talking about getting along with nobody. They talking about India. <laughs> Palestinians ain't talking about getting along. They talking about Palestine. White folks are talking about white supremacy. Arabs are talking about Allah Akbar. And black folks talking about every single one of the things I just said. <laughs> we got to start talking about black dominion, rulership, conquest. We should rule because we're the best and we got to pay off all the debts. We owe a lot of people some debt. And we got to make sure we're, we're good creditors. So we got, we got to pay our credits and debts to everybody that we owe. And we should be in charge. And then we got to start making it happen. Now, I'm yelling it loud. Everybody don't have to yell it loud. That ain't how you do it, you know. You don't have to. We just do it. My job is to put myself out in front and speak it so that you know it. You internalize it, and it doesn't matter how we get it done as long as we win, and as long as we still proud productive Africans at the end of it. But you ain't got to do it the way I do it because <laughs> it becomes a little difficult sometimes. That's my job. Where are we going? It's about 1.25 billion black people on the planet today. This is 2018. By 2118, that's 100 years, we want 3 billion black people. It means we want to triple our population on this planet. And we're going to have to be thinking like that in order to survive because we're behind the eight ball in terms of the genocidal programs they have against us, they already have in place. The machines to resist them, we don't have in place. So we're going to have to start populating. Now, in order to do that, we got to be able to feed, clothe, house, and educate our children so that they understand their job is to overthrow this planet and to rule. So what does that mean? That means we're as close to uh, you know, 0.75 billion here or so in Africa. You, every black woman got to look at how many children did my mother have? I got to have, if she had two, I got to have six. We're tripling our population around the world. That's one thing. Two, Africa, as we know it today, I suggest will become one Africa. That will be the term. And this land mass will be populated by black people with black mothers and fathers only, I'm going to say it again, every person on this continent in a hundred years, unless they're being tried for some crime, <laughs> they're not going to be here that long, is going to have a black mother and a black father, and we're going to be able to look at them and know that they're black. This going to be home. But then, the southern eastern regional corner of America, that's going to be northwest Africa. Because in order to 
protect the interests of Africans here, we've seen when we don't have connection with the world and trade and things of that nature, we become under assault. So we're not going to be coming under assault because we're going to have somebody everywhere. There's about 100 million uh, uh, of our, our brothers and sisters in India that they don't even own a caste system. They treat them horribly. They call them the untouchables. We got to connect with them and, and, and raise power there. That will be Northeast Africa, Southwest Africa, the region of Brazil, and that southern region of South America will become an African dominion. And all of these are part of one country, with the base of the country, one Africa, here. And I'm talking about the whole here. I'm talking about Cairo, I'm talking about Egypt, Mauritania, I'm saying black. Black like that, 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 that stand right here that I'm looking at, that's looking at me right here, like this camera. Black, my brother right there, we, we're going to change the context of what Africa looks like. It's not a playground anymore for anybody. That's 100 years. We got time to do it. I think it's a good place to start because I can feel the spirit. <laughs> start from the bottom, push on up. Now, <clears throat> how are we going to work economically? I talked about it a little bit before. The economic picture of our people becomes this in order to get to that place. We've got to start changing the way we think. Whatever a black group of people have access to anywhere in the world must become something we need, we feel as though we can't live without, and we definitely want to pay for. Because we don't want no group of black people nowhere to be starving economically and that economic leverage being used to make them sell out their own interests and their own families. So we want to make sure every black person, if you have gold in Africa, every black person around the planet has access to gold. Why? Because they're black. That's your passport. You might have a written one, but that's your real passport. I'm looking at you when you get off the plane in Africa. Can you get access to gold? Yeah, he can. It's a brother. Oh, it's my sister. Sure, she can get access to gold. Why not? Where you at? Oh, there? Well, you need gold, don't you? Okay, come on. You need uranium, you need silver, whatever it is that we need. And we might not have everything that we need, but guess what? Whatever we have is what we absolutely feel like we need, we cannot live without, and we want to pay for. That becomes our basis of exchange. This is how we get ourselves up economically. Another piece that we have to do. This is going to be the most difficult piece because it's not you and me. It's me and me. We are going to have to overthrow in a complete and absolute manner, the integrationists in us. Now this is hard because the integrationist was not created by the Euro or the Arab. Our very nature has some aspect of our personality where we prefer to love somebody that don't look like us to one that does. We prefer to forgive enemies that should be destroyed and slain than to give them adequate justice. That is a problem. All of us ain't like that though. <laughs> I can tell because most of y'all have stayed, so everybody's not like that. You couldn't stand here this long with me if you felt that way. Those of us who don't feel that way, we have a problem. And this has been going on for 6,500 years. Read the book, The Destruction of Black Civilization. Those of us who prefer our brothers and sisters to everybody else, we end up not being in power. We get outmaneuvered by integrationists for a number of reasons. One, because the integrationism is inside of each one of us. It's just part of our personality. We can't lie to ourselves. This idea of wanting to be nice and warm, and it, it, I don't know where it came from. I guess it just came from God. I don't know, but that's the part of God. You know, we got to say, God, well, let us hang on for a minute until we get this right and get back to ourselves. But loving these folks is killing us. That don't work. We need to love them the same way they love us. We're hatchets. We got to get serious with this. There's no reason for friends that don't look like African people until we get control of the planet. And then once we get control of the planet, we don't need no more friends. That's going to be the most difficult thing because in every place that I've looked internationally for African people, where we've been in combat, the integrationists has sabotaged every single one. I could talk about Haiti, but why? We're in Azania. Can I talk about Azania? Yes. Now this is from what I've been given and shared. I'm sharing with you what you already know, but tell me if I'm sharing it correctly. Get the brother like Sabukwe who says, look, one settler, one brother, we're going to take it. And they're marching. I was in America. Nobody told me about Sabukwe. I just knew this doesn't make sense. Why is Nelson Mandela getting out? I didn't know because he had to get out. Not because uh, they liked Nelson Mandela. They needed somebody to fight 
the momentum of Sabukwe and the warriors that were out here blowing up. Uh, uh, they wasn't blowing up just things. They was finding physical whites. You got to go. This is our land. Give me back my fire. You got to go. You got to go. This thing is getting in. The momentum is building. We got numbers. We got to drive. We got, we're going to take our land back. Now the whites say, how can we stop this? We don't have enough numbers. What are we going to do? We're moving towards freedom and the integrationists in America. You've heard of Martin Luther King, right? An integrationist. You know why you know his name? Because of a man they don't tell you about named Robert F. Williams. Robert F. Williams was the real deal. Robert F. Williams, and you look him up for yourself, but we have videos that we show and teach about. If you just put him up, Robert F. Williams, on YouTube and listen to him, you go, oh, no wonder they taught us about Martin Luther King. They needed somebody to stop black people who had armed ourselves all across the South. So we sick of the Klan. We start pushing the Klan out of their communities. We was getting serious. They needed somebody to tell our people, put your guns down, hold hands with your enemies, love them, we shall overcome. And they, they paid money to Martin Luther King to do it. And when he finally got enough time around the real warriors, he started saying, man, this ain't right what I'm doing. He started changing his tone. They said, we got to kill this dude. Because he did have some magic in the way he could talk. And they knew if he joins with these, it's over. The same integrationist Negro, we are the world, multicultural, ridiculous thread that flew and destroyed the black liberation movement in America, that destroyed your liberation movement here in South Africa, and that destroyed all the black civil, uh, even in the Haitian Revolution, Toussaint Louverture, one of love the white folks, Dessaline said, I love him hanging from a tree. Good thing Toussaint got taken away and Dessaline took over and he said, okay, you got two choices, leave or die. It doesn't matter to me. And the Haitians won their independence because the independence leaders are the ones who love African people more than anything else that they love. For the 21st century, what we're going to have to do through whatever means we can, the most sophisticated, the most harshest in some cases, the most, even if it's vile, whatever it takes to subdue the integrationists to the background. Yes, you can live amongst us. You still are people. You can't have no opinion, though. You better not raise your mouth and talk about, you know, you don't, you don't bring them amongst us, but you still are people. As long as you subdued in your integrationism, we've got to take the independence people. We've got to take power. It's non-negotiable. And in doing that, and this is the last thing I'll say and I'll go to the people, it's not going to be just enough to take power. We've got to be competent. See, okay, you put all the whites off, the land, and now it's all black people running it. We don't know how to run our own running water. What's gonna happen, it ain't gonna take long. People gonna say, I want the whites back. <laughs> Even I was oppressed, at least I had some nice hot water when I was, you know. <laughs> and then the reality that it happens is real. We gotta actually figure out how to organize internationally to have the people in places that know how to properly educate, science, mathematics, infrastructure, we got to know how to do these things, technology. We actually got to be prepared to do those things so that when we do start seizing power, it feels good to the person that now has their own. So when we take this land, are we able to quickly put up basic accommodations so that we can be comfortable, so that our children are comfortable, so that our women are comfortable, and then we can build nicer structures as we move along? Can we grow our own food continuously? competently and feed our people to where they're enjoying eating and enjoying having their own land which is then going to make them want more, more what they want more freedom see when freedom feels good when you got it you want more when land is good when you got it you need more land because with more land we can feed more of our people and then we can make enough food here then our brothers and sisters that are starving in another part of Africa, they don't need to worry about food. We'll charge, we'll pay each other for the food, take that money and the extra food, we'll just ship it out to those brothers and sisters, get them on their feet. We can do that when we have it and when we can produce it for ourselves. As long as we're not competent. You know, black power, that's not competency. I, I still like black power, but I'm just saying, that alone is not competency. Can we build a weapon? Can we build a weapon that makes the gun as obsolete as their gun made our spears. Why not? If it's warfare and technology exists, we ain't got nothing else to do anyway, half the time. We can't get some of these young people who don't have nothing to do to say, think of something. You got all this technology and radiation, all this. Come up with something. I'm not a scientist, you do it. Make something that makes their gun as useless to them in fighting us 
as our spirits became when they brought their guns. Are we talking like this as Africans? Have you heard anybody say that? No. Why not? Isn't it the time? Yes. Our problems are the same. You have Nyaupes in America, we have Nyaupes here. They, we have zombies, you have zombies there, we have zombies here. We have rampant teenage pregnancy there, we have, we have rampant teenage pregnancy here. You have a lack of self-sufficiency of your own. people in America. They don't do things for themselves, they don't feed themselves. It's the same thing here. So if we start building a model here, right, and we are building this connection, we are building this relationship, then we are dealing with the matter of our lack of imagination as a people. Now we are unlocking people's imagination. They can see, oh, we can feed ourselves. Shit. We can actually grow the maize meal that we regularly eat. It's our staple diet. I think we can be responsible enough to do that. We're not looking at far off things. We're not talking about a space program here. Right. We're talking about growing something from a seed, from the soil, from the water, and an abundant sun, which we have, which we, we have been blessed with. Right, so I think in short, maybe let's not take advantage the small blessings that we have and the communication, brother. I think we have to make an effort to keep it up to see that aspect that you're talking about trade. I mean, it has me imagining a whole lot of possibilities what you can put on the table, what we can put on the table. Granted, land has been taken from us here, but there's a lot of things that we can do with a little bit of access to land that we have that can help us uh, first, in my opinion, deal with that major aspect that, you know, is going to have us hitting the walls as we're building this revolution. And that's the matter of resource and, 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 and you know, the economic muscle to keep the mission going, you know, to keep our soldiers because we often lose our soldiers to the system because also in our efforts, we you know, we lose a uh, focus on that aspect in making sure that we are totally self-sufficient, totally independent of, in every aspect of our organization. We don't need white people. We don't need funding from the government. Everything we're doing for ourselves. It's, it's good as well to inspire those that will be looking from a distance, you know, and inspire them to do, to do more. This is the value of uh, exchange that must be encouraged among African people because we have been taught to discriminate against one another, let alone the diaspora. But here in Africa itself, we've got names that we give to other Africans. Very, very bad sounding names on topically that we give to our own because we have been told that we're different and we have accepted it. And we have been told that uh, the white man is superior and we have accepted it. We even have phrases for it. We say, which means the white man is the palm, not the palm, but the palm. <laughs> of the African without the white man, the African will die. We believe this. We have been made to believe it up to today. It's still happening. That's a Sutu version. And we've got a Zulu version, which says, Umlungu Mdala, which means the white man is superior. He takes precedence. So those are the acceptances that we have. Steve Biko said that the most potent weapon that the white man is using against the African is the mind of the African. So how do you run away practically from your mind? Because for, uh, to save yourself from that weapon, which is your mind, you must run away from it. That's called flight. Or you must fight against that thing that uh, actually puts you down, victimizes you, and causes you hurt. But practically, it is not possible to fight against your mind and to molest it and destroy it. So we are really between the rock and the hard place. But uh, we must use our own mind to liberate ourselves. That's the only way. The dependency syndrome 
which uh, he spoke about in different ways, where we're dependent, we don't do things our, you know, ourselves. The young man who spoke here behind me also spoke about being fed by other people and, and not uh, being able to actually produce our own food. And we send our children, we buzz them to be taught by other people. What do we expect? And we do it, you know, so diligently, you know, and studiously with great commitment and passion that our children must be empowered, we say. They must go and be taught in the Model C schools. Now, we've got a great job to do, comrades. What we are facing is a great task that has got to be performed by this generation of the youth. We did our part. I'm getting exhausted and weary now. But you are there to take the baton and continue with this. But the only people who will succeed in this great crusade, in this great war that uh, is busy taking place now, are those people who accept that most of the things, maybe over 90% of the things that we quest for and fight for presently and have to fight for tomorrow won't be achieved in our lifetime. South Africanness represent the destruction of Africa. The existence of South Africa is to destroy Africa, is to destroy Africanness, is to destroy African imagination, is to destroy the African vision, so that we must continue to perpetuate the very same colonial vision that was espoused by the likes of Augustus' Rhodes and all these vampires who came all the way right. from Europe to rob, to kill, right. because our land was taken by force. That's right. The land was taken, and it, it must be taken back again That's by right. us African people. But one thing which is very important is for us to embrace our African identity, our Africanness in totality, and reject this colonial, you know, you know, identity because really they represent a cancer to us. You see, so that's why we must also destroy the myth that you can be an African if you you are a South African. That is impossible. Though there are some people who are claiming that they are South African and they are also African at the same time. But that is impossible by virtue that South Africa is for the destruction of Africa. So South Africanness and Africanness cannot coexist. They cannot coexist, you know. So this is very important, the embracement of our African identity. Pan-Africanism, we must recognize ourselves as one nation. It is all over the world. It is in, in India, in Australia, in the Pacific, Solomon Islands. We, we know black people like us. In China, we know black people all over the world. Which means our pan-African vision must be centered around our blackness. Because we are black people. And we are the first people in this universe. And as African people, as black people, there is a need for us to know that we are universal people. We are not continental people. So our nation is not Africa, the continent. Because we have our people in Australia who are indigenous in Australia. They are indigenous in China. They are indigenous all over the world. Where they only indigenous people in this universe because wherever other nation other people came we were already there Black power. Black power. even in europe we are in indigenous people of, of, of that land yes sir. so that is the fact which means we are a universal people we're not a continental people so we need to embrace our families 
even in the Pacific. So there is the element that Pan-Africanism tend to be evolving around Africans in the continent and those Africans in, in the West. You see, those who are in America and in, in Europe. But we must see Pan-Africanism as a movement of African people in India. Like, as the brother has already even mentioned, that we have our own African family in India. Even the last eight Pan-African Congress that was here at Verd University, I think it was around 2014, there were brothers and sisters of the African family who were coming from India, attending a Pan-African movement, the Conference of African People, identifying themselves with the continent, with our pain, with our struggle. So this is very important that we must understand that we are a universal people. We have a global presence. We're not just in Africa or in the West. So Pan-Africanism must be universal. It must not be within the continent and with the Africans, mainly those in the West. So in those words, I was just trying just to add on that, my brethren. But we give thanks for your presentation. And I hope that this movement, the straight black pride movement, can also have its roots in Africa because it's really for the empowerment of black people all over the world. That's right. We give thanks. One element, one element my brother mentioned to me about straight black pride is that it enables us to separate the wolf from the sheep. You know, uh, we are able to see all the people who are serious about the African family, about the African struggle, because our struggle as a nation, there's no way we can build a nation if we can't build families. Mm -hmm. You know? And uh, homosodomy has been created by white supremacy deliberately, you know, to, to, to destroy our families, to destroy African manhood. As my brother said, that Cecil John Rhodes used to rape and sodomize young black boys and throw them off a cliff. When Jan van Riebeck arrived here, they sodomized our grandfathers. They raped our grandmothers, raped our sisters, our young men, our warriors, you see. You know, and so a homosodomy is a weapon that is used by white supremacy in the modern day, currently. And so we have to know that and understand that. And all of those people, you know, who are standing on the fence on that issue, there's a problem there, you know, because it means you are integrationist. You are integrating now into homosodomy. You are becoming what is known as a promo sodomist, a promophile, you see. You promote it. You don't speak against it. You have accepted it, you know. You are part and parcel of the, you know, everyone else, you see, who, you know, uh, because that's the system. The system uses each and every, uh, I mean, tool of propaganda. They are in the media. Ape Azania, you know, Aboso Mizi, Bapopula Kakulu, and the likes. There is minimal television programs as Koyo, which do not have or promote homosodomy as something that is normal because that's one that's the one thing which we have to understand it's an insanity right. it's an insane european behavior which they want to become normal and that is why the american government bo european unions even united nations all of their institutions will push it and they will use whatever means they have you see to make sure that africans accept this thing you know, it's part and parcel of the weapons that my brother has mentioned. I mean, uh, the father of modern sexuality is a white boy called Alfred Kinsey. That's right. And Alfred Kinsey is the man who, who spoke that it is normal and that it is something that is, uh, must be practiced to sodomize a, a five-month-old child. Right. 
A five month old child must be masturbated by an old uh, man. You see, a, a, a five year old child must be sodomized by an old wrinkled 70 year old uh, white boy. This is Alfred Kinsey. It is him upon which the so called homosexual movement, their ideas are based on Alfred Kinsey's ideas. He wrote two books, two volumes of books, in which he was justifying a pedophilia that uh, my brother was speaking about. You see? And so, homosexuality is not only about the so called love that they tell us about that. No, this is an emotion. These people love one another. These people, they are born like this. It is infused into us using chemical warfare through the foods that we eat, the poisons that they feed us, that alter our hormonal structure. You see, uh, even before a child is born, sometimes some children are born with deformities. You see, which we are now being made to see as uh, something that is, that is normal. And so the, the white system is using every means possible, you see, to make homosexuality, uh, you know, uh, normalized. All of the things that they are talking about, the gender studies that they have in the universities today, you know, where they are questioning gender, questioning gender roles, questioning sexuality, all of the theories that are being developed today by the university professors, all of those things are rooted in Alfred Kinsey's That's right. theories, That's right. uh, which promote pedophilia. That's right. In homo sodomy, because we have to know that these people in the 1960s, early 1960s, when their so-called movement started, they were fighting for the rights of sodomy. They used to say it outright like that before they made it something that is a sexuality. And you have to know that pederasty, as my brother spoke about it, or pedophilia, sleeping with little children, is a European culture. That's right. They are kings in Europe. They are kings in Greece. You know, their history has it all. That they use, this was part and parcel of who they were. And that is why they want us to see it as normal. That's why they want the whole world, everyone must see this thing as normal. Because to them, in their European worldview, it is normal to sleep with a child. Not only with a child. Homosexuality or homosodomy does not stop there. It goes further. They sleep with animals. The dogs that they love more than a black man and a black woman, they sleep with them. The reason why you see them loving their dogs so much, driving with their dogs around, they sleep with them in their beds. They have sexual intercourse with their beds. They have homosodomist acts with their, uh, those dogs. White uh, men and white uh, women, white boys and white girls. It's part and parcel of their culture and their practices. They do it you know, on, a daily, on a daily basis. And they want this behavior to be normalized. They even have a name for it. It's called bestiality. It goes further. They have something called necrophilia. They sleep with the dead. You see? So this is part and parcel of homosodomy. You see? It's part and parcel of what they will introduce after, you know, uh, some time, these are, t you know, it, it comes with time. So for now, we must accept that it is normal, you know, for a man, you know, to sodomize a young boy or to sodomize another man. We must now see it as normal for a woman to have a sodomic act with another a woman, you know. And so this is person, person of what white supremacy is doing to take out our humanity take out our humanness as African people. We have never behaved like this. We have never had any kings, no queens in Africa, no any societies, whole societies and communities in Africa that are promoting uh, this deviant behavior. So sons and daughters of the soil, with those words, we are grateful to be connected, you know, with Africans abroad. Because we certainly know for the fact that there's been a deliberate program by white supremacy to keep us separated and apart. From the time the first Africans were snatched from the continent, they have had a deliberate programs.
to keep us apart from from connecting with one another you see and from actually having deliberate programs you see that will liberate us as african people globally you see as a uh, rasa viewers even said before we are global people as michael tellinger and uh, he wrote a book the uh, slave species of god where he delineates and explains how white people were manufactured and he got all that information from credo mutua and does not credit him he does not credit credo so the and, and, and this we must know all the time that these people were actually manufactured those people who say that uh, we are the natural indigenous people of the world, they are telling the truth because That's these right. people were imported and manufactured, and that is why they are, that is why they cannot even relate to nature. That's right. That's right. They compete, mm. we cooperate. <laughs> and there are many other things, uh, uh, differences that show that they don't belong to this environment That's right. called planet Earth. That's right. Thank you.